God's so good. God's presence is evident. I'm just, you know, just thinking of my salvation, which is 30, how long ago? 34 years ago. I was the age of 19. And I thought, Lord, what happens if I didn't get saved? I know the tra- trajectory I was on. I know the road that I was on. I know the journey that I was on. And the life I would have lived would have been so um, full of destruction, full of pain, full of hurt until God changed my life. And I never want to ever take that for granted. At the age of 19, gave my life to the Lord. And um, many years later, just seeing his faithfulness, we're singing that song, faithful, you are faithful, so powerful. And I think my mind goes to us just believing every word we, we read the word. We're going to go in to like a, it's not a Bible study, but we're going to go for a lot of scriptures. I hope you came to hear the word of God. Not my opinion, not someone else's opinion, but if it's the word of God, we've got to get to the place where we know what, we just simply believe it. And when you simply believe, it'll change your life. It'll transform your whole life. Today, I want to talk about um, living for eternity. Living our life here and now for eternity. And um, I saw this example on Francis Chan, if you've heard of him. But he, he, did this, he did this example many years ago. But let me see if I can unravel this. See how far it goes. Didn't go too far, did it? But... Here we are. Come on, go. We need you to go. <laughs> let it go. Let it go as far as it goes. Let it go as far. That's it. Imagine this is, this line is a picture of your life. But imagine that this line goes on forever and ever and ever. It doesn't end. That's eternity. Imagine this, imagine going around the world. Once, twice, three, four, five times, and through the universe, and as far as the universe is right now, it just goes on forever and ever. It hasn't got an end, but this is your life here and now. You're, you and I are living our life. This, what we do here, determines where we live here and how we live here, because there is a heaven and there is a hell. So, accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord. And as our Savior, we know that the, you know, if you, your, your faith is in Christ, we know that there's no way to the Father except through Jesus. This is the, the, the fundamentals of Christianity. If you're going to believe the truth, you have to believe there's only one way to the Father, only one way into the presence of God where the Father dwells in heaven. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no two ways. You can't find another way in. You're either going to go through Jesus, can't go through being a good person, can't go, I'm going to live my life perfect, I'm going to fight, just, just be a good person. No, you're not going to get that way. You're going to get in through Jesus. And once you give your life to Jesus, then our eternity is in heaven. But what we do here still determines how we live in, 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 in eternity. Now, some of these things you probably haven't even thought of. Some of these things you have thought, hang on, is that true? I thought we just go to heaven and we all make it. Yeah, we all make it in heaven because of Jesus. That's the foundation. But the way you and I live in heaven to the degree of the glory of God we experience in heaven determines how we live our life here on earth. And some of us live our life here, um, live so much, all the things we do, all the things we do, all for the end part here, for retirement. And we save money and we, you know, we, we do all the things that we have to do and invest and, and do everything because I want to, my, my last 15, 20 years on earth, once I retire, maybe you might get 30 years after you retire, I, I do everything here for this part. Forgetting you got a whole eternity. Your life here will determine where you spend eternity and how you spend eternity. You might go, hang on, do I really believe that? We're going to go through Scripture and show you from the Word of God how clear, it's absolutely clear, it's all over the Bible, mind you. I'll leave that there. I mean, when you think of this, this is a perfect example of delayed gratification. You know, you've heard of the, I'm sure everyone must have heard of what delayed gratification means. A delayed gratification means I delay what I could have got now for something better later. This is the perfect, this is the, the, the greatest revelation of that example to its fullest. Because we're talking about eternity. I deny myself now because of eternity. Jesus spoke about it all the time. If you deny your life here on earth, you shall find it. If you try to find your life, you will lose it. If you deny your life, if you lose your life, the life that this world could have given you, if you lose it for my sake, you will find real life. And actually you find real life. 
It's the absolute life of God. The word life in the Bible is the, this word called zoe. The best way to des- describe this word is God kind of life. It's not because God himself is eternal. So when you, when you accept Jesus Christ, you come into the God kind of life in every area of your life. It's not something that I've got eternal life now and I use this ticket, so to speak, to get out of hell and it's escape, it's escape sort of to escape hell, judgment, you know, eternal judgment in hell. And so uh, when I die, I'm going to end up using this eternal life. No, you use eternal life is God kind of life. You use it every single day of your life. It's something you come into because of what Jesus did for us. In Him there is life. Delayed gratification is the act of resisting an impulse or desire to take an immediate valuable, uh, sorry, to, to take an immediately available reward in the hope of obtaining a more valued reward in the future. They did an experiment with little children with a marshmallow candy in front of them, and they they said. Um, you can eat this marshmallow or you can wait and in, into the future, not, not too long, you don't have to wait too long, you will get two marshmallows. They walked out, the scientists walked out and about 80 to 90% of the children ate it straight away because it was a gratification that they can get right now. They, they, they didn't want to wait. Some were smart enough to go, if I wait just a little bit, I end up getting two of them. So there were some that got two um, because they waited. But then, then that, that test goes down the hill when, you, when the person that said they'll, you'll get a better, you'll get two candies. Um, when they break their promise, when they try to do the experiment again, most people eat it now because the promise wasn't fulfilled. The promise wasn't kept. But they say also that this trait of delayed gratification is in um, like you, the people that have this uh, succeed in life better. They have this understanding. They see, oh, you've, got to, you've got to use this all the time. A cake comes, a nice chocolate cake. And I can eat it now. I can enjoy it right now. But I can say no to it. And I can actually, the reason why I say no is because I want to feel better. I might want to be, uh, look better. I don't want to have, I want to have abs. Why do we go to the gym? To work hard, to feel, to feel better, fit, to feel stronger. You get more energy. But you've got to go through the pain of going to the gym. You know, when you don't feel like it, you work your body and you exercise, you, you run, you, you go on the treadmill, you do cardio, you do the things you do. Why do you do that? Delayed gratification. So I can feel better later. Healthier later, stronger later, Ment- mentally stronger, mentally alert, stay fit for the long run. Why do we do these? It's a delayed gratification thing. We do it all the time. Why, do, why does someone say, no, I'm not going to go out tonight. I'm going to go home and I'm gonna stay home and study because I've got to pass my, my degree. I, got to, I study, I discipline myself, delay gratification because I want to pass my degree. We do it all the time. You're designed for this. You know, when I was a rugby league player, I would work, I would, we would train our guts off. We would get so fit. Just so when you do play, you win because you're fitter than the other team. And we play the moves and you train the moves. Not necessarily f- exactly fun because sometimes it's hard work training, but it's all for the accolade of human praise because there's crowd there that's gonna no one wants to lose so when you win you win you get you get this great joy of winning yeah but you did all the hard work delayed gratification we do it everywhere I when I used to break dance we did the same thing Tony and I were in a, 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 a group called autocrats and we trained hard I mean sometimes we got ourselves so fit with you know what, let's just do the leg work on the ground break dancing and let's do it until we got no more energy left why are we doing that? I'll tell you why. Honestly, because I didn't know Jesus at that time, was to show off at a nightclub. To get all the attention of, wow, why? So this is delayed gratification. You work hard because you want to be rewarded later. Now, our humanness, we're created this way. But I think there's, a, there's, a, there's the nature of God in this. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 it says it really clearly. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So if I seek God, I will be rewarded in this life and in the life to come. So we need to see everything in the light of eternity. Let me read Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. If you've got your Bibles, open it up, have a look, read it with your own eyes. I want us just to believe the Word this morning, okay? Simply believe what we read because it's so powerful. 
this is Jesus saying this in verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels. The glory of His Father. We just missed that. The glory of His Father. Jesus is going to come in the glory of His Father. You know how, how glorious the Father is? You can't look upon God on the throne and live right now. If you, if you were taken to the throne, and you, 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 you disintegrate in your body. Your body cannot handle it. Your flesh can't handle the glory of God. God the Father shines brighter than the sun. So when Jesus comes back to this planet, the Bible is really clear. In that day, the sun will turn to darkness. The moon to blood. It won't shed its light. Other translations say it won't shed its light. The stars from heaven will fall. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. And when the glory of Jesus comes to this planet, the sun can't shine. It will go dark compared to the glory of the light of Jesus. So when He comes, this is Jesus' words, with His angels and the glory of His Father, and then He, Jesus, shall reward every man according to His works. God, God Himself, Jesus will, record, will, will reward everyone. Everyone say everyone. Everyone according to their works. Everyone in this room has different levels of works. We're not talking about works of salvation, works for salvation. We're talking about works of obedience. And we get it rewarded in heaven according to the works of obedience that we live here on earth. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. We're going to go through the Word. Just, just to remind you, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, the Word of God says, God has set eternity in their hearts. God has set eternity in the hearts of man. There's eternity in there because God's in there. You were created for way more than this life here and now. If everything you do, I mean, everything that we grow up in, everything that stimulates our attention, our eyes, our ears, the books you read, the movies you watch, the, the people you see, the, the, the entertainment, the, the, the commercials, the billboards, everything, everything that comes to us is about how to live life now. How to get, how to get happy now. How to get fulfilled now. How to be happy now. Get this car, get this new car because it'll be, give you comfort, it'll give you this, it'll give you luxury, it'll give you, it'll give you it to you now. Everything's designed. Come and buy this new house. Get this clothes. Put this makeup on. Put, everything's designed. Think about how much is filling us for the here and now. We need to hear the Word of God to live for eternity. Or else all our decisions in life is all about the here and now. How does it bless me now? The Australian culture, I'm telling you, our decision making is, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? If I do this thing, what good am I going to get out of it? That's the Australian culture. That's, that's it. It's a worldly culture. Kingdom culture is to lay down your life to serve Him, to please the Father. Matthew 11, verse 20. Everyone believes the words of Jesus here? Okay, you've come to hear the Word of God, I hope. Chapter 11, verse 20. This is the words of Jesus. This blows my mind still today. Um, chapter 11, verse 20. Then he began to denounce. Jesus himself began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Think about this. Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Messiah is in the flesh, the anointed one. He heals the sick. He cleanses lepers. He opens up blind eyes. And that town didn't repent. Wow. And so he, he denounces them. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon is one of the worst cities. They were immoral in many ways. What the Lord Jesus is saying is if I did the miracles in that town, they would have repented. And if they repented, they would not have been judged. And they'll still be here today. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, to hell, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, you know how bad Sodom was? If these miracles that Jesus did here in the Capernaum were done in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Sodom wouldn't have been judged because they would have repented. 
Nevertheless, I say to you, look at the words of Jesus, that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. I mean, that's heavy. Let's, let's just analyze this for a second. What does this actually mean? Sod- Sodom was judged for all sorts of immoral sexual um, conduct. Really, really evil stuff. And eventually the, the whole, you know, the, the brimstone from heaven came and they, the whole city was destroyed. Capernaum were Jewish going, synagogue going people. They go to the synagogue every Saturday. They, they you know, they, they looked outwardly good. But the son of the living God came, demonstrated signs, wonders and miracles, preached the gospel and they didn't repent. So they rejected a great light. So they're going to be judged more for what they rejected than their lifestyle. That means the day of judgment will be more tolerable for Sodom than for Campanium. But outwardly, they look like they're nice, going, Jewish, obeying, synagogue, attending believers. But they rejected the Son of God. It says something. We're going to be judged by the light and the revelation that comes to us. And, and I, I just blows me away that Sodom will have a better day of, day of judgment than Campanium. People that live there. I want to know how God's going to judge us. Not what the world tells us how, how God's going to judge us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures, so please bear with me. I, I, I'm praying that this will impart faith to us so that when we read the Word of God, we believe the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul talks about the judgment to come. Where are we? Chapter 3. Once upon a time, we used to hear this in the church. You know, the paper, everyone's, but now everyone's got their laptops and mobiles. And I read my Bible on my, my mobile a lot and my, lap, my iPad. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is Paul. And he's talking in verse 7. Okay. He says, Verse 7, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Verse 8, now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. There we go, there we go again. The Word of God saying each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Every single person here has a reward from God according to the labor you've given him. You will be rewarded in heaven. Do you believe that? Everything you do in obedience to God will be rewarded. And he goes on to say, for verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. We're, we're working together with God, right? According to God, so who's, you know, who's a planter? And who, God's a Apollos was a waterer, but God gives the increase. So when you plant a seed to someone, you're sharing the word, you're planting it, and someone else shares the word to them, they're watering it, but God brings the increase. So we're talking about laboring with God, working with God, sharing the faith, sharing the gospel to other people, right? Verse 10, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. Paul is saying, make sure you're careful how you build on this foundation. And he goes on to say, now if any man builds, no, sorry, verse 11, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You can't lay a different foundation other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. If you don't have Jesus as the foundation, then you're not saved. You don't belong to him. Jesus has to be in your life, talking about Him being Lord of your life, you following Him, you gave Him, you gave him your life and now He's your Lord and now you follow Him through obedience to His Word. You're a disciple, you're, you're a disciplined person, you're, you're, you're here to obey Him. And it says now in verse 12, Now if any man builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay and straw. Now there's gold, silver and precious stone all can handle fire. They're elements that go through the fire and get purified. Gets, gold goes through the fire. It burns the impurities of the gold, but the gold remains. Same with silver. It can be heated up. 
and precious stones, but not wood, hay, and straw. You know what happens to wood, hay, and straw, yeah. all right? Each man's work, talking about you, this is talking about you, this is you, right? Each man's work will become evident, in, in other words, revealed, exposed, or uncovered. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. For the day will show it. The day in here is always referred to the, the day of judgment. You can do your own study. The Word of God talks about the day of the Lord or the day of judgment. The day, and when it refers to the day, it's talking about the day of judgment. So the day of judgment will expose every single thing I've ever done for God. And will expose everything I've ever done not for God. And I'll stand before God and give an account. I want to show you a, a house that burns. Because the Bible does talk about, you know, you build your life on the Word. You're like a house that builds your life on on the rock, and the floods comes down, and storms comes down, and, and great, and, 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 and the house stood because it's built on the rock, but if you build it on the sand, so your house represents your life and what you build it on, right? So I'm going to show you, I just want to show you a house burning, and you'll see one day, you and I, imagine your life being the house, you will go through the fiery day of judgment. We know that Jesus... We know that when John saw Jesus, his eyes were like a flame of fire. When I think of the flame of fire of Jesus' eyes, I feel like when he looks into me, he looks to me with love. He sees my life with pure love. And, and in that fiery love, he burns what's not of God. So whatever's not of God in me burns away, but he, but he loves me. The love purifies me. Are you, are you with me? The fiery love of God's eyes, He burns me, burns what's not of God, burns the impurities. But whatever is of God will remain. This is facing the day of judgment. One day, your life will stand before the fiery presence of God. Now, you know the Bible does say God is fire from His loins up and a fire from His loins being His belt down. That's when Daniel saw the Lord on the throne. He couldn't explain it any other way. It just looked like God was on fire because of the glory of God. The, the fire. And so look what it says here. Each man's work will be evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. We're talking about building on the foundation of Jesus. So anything you do on top of the foundation of Jesus will go through the fire. If any man's work which he has built on on it remains, he will receive a reward. And we're not just talking about, oh, here's a reward like a trophy. Here's a re trophy. We're talking about, I, I, I believe the reward that we receive from Jesus has got to do with the glory we walk into in heaven. And how do you know that, Leo? From the Bible. If you just, for those uh, uh, word, word people, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes clearly about the resurrection. And he goes, every resurrection is different in glory. He goes, just like the sun is different from the moon and the moon and, and the stars are different in, 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 in glory. Talking about glory. They shine different. They, they glorify different. The stars, the physical stars. So it is with the resurrection. He's actually saying the resurrection, we're going to be shining differently like the sun has a different glory to the moon and the moon has a different glory to the stars and each star is different in glory and so it is with the resurrection. There's your scripture. In the resurrection, you'll, you'll come into a realm of the glory of God but you could be least in the kingdom or you could be great in the kingdom. Did you know that? How do you say that, Leah? It's in the Bible too. It's the words of Jesus. Jesus himself said in Matthew, I think it's, um, is it seven or five? Chapter five, maybe, or seven. When he talks about the, the things of the kingdom. And he says, he who does these words and fulfills the, the word of God and the law of God um, is great in the kingdom of heaven. But he who teaches others not to do it is least in the kingdom of heaven. Hang on a sec. Can you be a least in the kingdom? And can you be a great in the kingdom? I thought you just get in the kingdom and you're all the same. No. God's not like that. You don't get in, the, we're not talking about the kingdom. Even the kingdom, you come into the kingdom straight away. The moment you accept Jesus, you're in the kingdom. And there are people that are least in the kingdom, there are people that are great in the kingdom. There's honor in the kingdom. So you, there's different honor given to people in the kingdom. To the degree of our obedience, we'll receive honor accordingly. Are you with me so far? I don't want my life to burn up and mount to nothing. Because when I used to read this as a baby Christian, it says, if any man's work is burned up, 
If any man's, verse 15, if any man's work that is built on the foundation of Jesus is burnt up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I used to read that. Go, How can you suffer loss when you're going to heaven? How do you suffer loss when you're entering? I'm talking about at the day of judgment, you stand before God and whatever he looks at my life, what I built on the foundation of Jesus. Basically, if I've done things for my selfish glory, it'll burn up. If I've done things out of disobedience, I've done things to get attention from people because of my selfish ambition. If I've done things out of obedience for selfish ambition and pride and I'm not out of obedience to God, it'll burn up and I'll suffer loss. How do I suffer loss when I'm about to go into heaven? What I would have received the glory for, what I would have received the reward for, I don't receive. That's how you suffer loss. But you're still saved. It says it there. But you're still saved because you've got Jesus Christ as a salvation. Are you following me? You're looking like... I've never heard this before. I think someone used to say, like a dog with a new kennel, like a dog, a dog with a new, um, what do you call it? When you feed them food. What's that? Anyway, just my mind's going there. But you know, I'm giving you scripture. Please know that. Matthew 5, verse 11 to 19 is where he said, Jesus himself says, least in the kingdom or great in the kingdom. You can choose what you want to be in the kingdom. Least or great. I, I, I want to be great in the kingdom. How can you be like that, Leah? How can you have a motive to want to receive reward or, or want to receive? I think it's because God gave that in, um, nature in us. God put it in us to want to be rewarded for what we do. It's, it's, God himself, it's like saying, I wake up in the morning, I want to fail today. I, I, I just want to miserably do bad today. No, no one wants to fail when you wake up in the morning and do life. You want to win, you want to be victorious, you want to succeed. True? Whatever you think happiness will bring you, you'll want to go for that. All right. Chapter, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Oh, let me read it to you. This is, this is when um, Jesus is talking about persecution. Luke 6, verse 22. Persecution, he says, Blessed are you when men hate you, and ostracize you, and insult you, and scorn you, your name as evil, for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day, and leap for joy. Why would we leap for joy? For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, their fathers used to treat the prophets. Your reward is great in heaven when people ridicule you here on earth. And Jesus says, rejoice in that day, because your reward's great in heaven. That's delayed gratification, isn't it? I'm being persecuted, I'm being hated, I'm being laughed upon, I'm being teased because I believe in Jesus. And the Lord says, rejoice because you got reward in heaven. That's the words of Jesus. Luke 6 verse 35 says, love your enemies and do good. Your reward will be great. Love your enemies. Who likes to love their enemies? Do good to your enemies. Why? Because your reward will be great in heaven. I mean, it's all over the Bible. In Matthew 10, this blows me away too, this one. Matthew 10, how am I doing for time? All right. You know how I get time when I need time? Who gives me five minutes? Anyone give me five minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Jokes, jokes, jokes. Um, Matthew 10, all right. Verse 41. What does he say here? Jesus himself, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. I mean, Jesus is going even down to the point, if you give someone a glass of water, Knowing that person's a disciple of Jesus and you just want to bless them and give them a glass of water, just that glass of water will be rewarded. Jesus said, truly, he won't, he won't lose his reward. He will receive a reward for doing an act of kindness as small as giving someone a glass of water. That tells me God's looking at every single thing we do. Everything we do, God's watching. Matthew 12, verse 36, write it, in your Bible, write it down in your notes. Have a look at it for yourself. But I say to you, the words of Jesus again, that every idle word that men or women shall speak shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. What? But I thought, Leo, I'm saved. Yes, you're saved. You're saved by grace. 
and grace alone. But every idle word, you know that word idle means useless word. I love this interpretation of it, unemployed word. We're supposed to employ our words. Give them something to do. You don't just waste words. You don't use your words wastefully and you never use your words to destroy people or to hurt people because you'll give an account for every idle word you ever speak. What, Leo? So again, when I stand before God, God's going to judge me for every word I ever spoke in this body. And a word that I spoke in hate or bitterness or unforgiveness or judgment or criticism, or I didn't employ my words to do the will of God. I'll be judged for that. And what will happen? It will burn up to nothing. Do I go to heaven? I still go to heaven. It's not about whether I make it or not. You as a believer don't go to Christ and stand before the judgments of Christ to say, I wonder if I make it. We're already citizens of heaven. We're already passed from death to life. That's a past tense thing. It's already happened. The Bible says right now you are already a citizen, a citizen of heaven. I actually belong in heaven already. I'm already in the kingdom of heaven. We're not talking about do I make it or not. We're talking about the reward. And, 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 and by the way, for those that don't know Christ, I believe there's different degrees of emptiness and lostness and, and, and separated from God forever. Forever. That's eternity. See, eternity is not a, a subject to... a. Uh, uh, um, I wonder if I live for eternity. No, we're all going to live for eternity. The whole problem is where will you live for eternity? With the Father or without the Father in hell? I want to be with the Father forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Have you ever thought about how long forever is? Look at this, verse 37. For your, by your words you'll be justified and by your, your words you'll be condemned. Your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. That's how God's going to judge us. There, there, there is a scripture, I'm just getting ahead of myself, the book of Revelations. It actually says that God's got books in heaven. He opens them up and everything you've ever done was written in those books. So God's got a recording system. And in those days, all they could understand is books. It's what it tells us, it's a recording system. I believe a video will play of our life. I believe God will show us everything we've ever done. We stand before judgment seat of Christ and give an account of what we've done in our bodies. Now, should the fear of God come in? 100% it should. The Bible actually says, and I'll read it in a moment, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, therefore, something like we have the fear of God. When you get a revelation of the judgment of God, you'll have the fear of God. I'm talking about the reverential fear of God. Are you with me? I hope you didn't come to church to get tick your ears tickled. I hope you came to church to hear the Word of God. To hear the Word of God. Not just to uh, encourage me, let me feel good, I want to feel good. I want to feel the Word should dissect. The Word should cut us. The Word should convict us. The Word should make us feel, oh my God, I need to change there. Oh, I need to repent there. Oh, yes, Lord, I want your Word. I want to become like Jesus. Jesus talks about our motives. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. They that seek reward for the glory of men. Talk about praying. When you pray, don't pray in front of, like the hypocrites do. They pray in front of everybody so they can be seen of men. And, and Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, they have their reward. You want to be seen of men? That's your reward. You will be seen of men. That's it. But hide yourself. Go in the closet where no man can see you. Pray to the Father who sees in secret who will reward you openly. So how are we supposed to live? How is our motive supposed to live? For the Father's eyes only. What I do, does that mean I never give in front of people? No, I can give in front of people to inspire people. Does that mean I never pray in front of people? Of course I pray in front of people. But that's not my motive. Oh, mate. Go to 2 Corinthians quickly. 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 9. Chapter 5, verse 9. What does it say? Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or at an absent, to be pleasing to the Lord. Whether you're at home in the body or absent from the body, you want to be pleasing to the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So to believers here. The believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Did you know that? The unbeliever stands at the great white throne judgment. 
Different judgment altogether. Book of Revelation chapter 20. The unbeliever stands before the great white throne judgment and all the books are open and the book of life is open. And, every, and they get judged by what's written in the books because it's recorded their life. And then it says, if their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will go thrown into the lake of fire. Because that's, that's where they accept Jesus Christ. The Lamb's book of life is recorded. It's like a registrar. It's like your reservation to go to heaven. God re- reserves like a reservation. Yes, you're a citizen of heaven. Write your name down. I don't know for sure, but in heaven, maybe with His blood. The Lamb's book of life. And look what it says here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may re- be recompensed for his deeds. Each one of us can be recompensed, paid, rewarded for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There's that scripture again. It's like, what? How do you get rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ, good or bad? So if I've done something in disobedience or selfish ambition and I, I, I built on my foundation with wrong wood, hay and stubble, in the day of judgment it gets burnt up, fire burns it up, that means I've done bad and it burns up to nothing and I suffer loss. But if I've done obedient and I've, done a, and I've, and I've obeyed and I sacrificed my life and I gave my life for His glory and, a, and just a little hard obedience to the Father, every little thing I do will be rewarded. Jesus Himself said in chapter 5, verse 29, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of the life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The words of Jesus. You're okay. You're there. 1 Timothy says, chapter 6, verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy, so that they do good. In other words, these rich people, charge them to do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, that means ready to give, willing to communicate, willing to share, and give of their substance, laying, when they do this, they're laying up a store for themselves, sorry, laying up in store for themselves, a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. It actually says when you obey God and and give and give generously, you're laying a good foundation, laying foundation for the life to come. That's good news. Colossians, I just want to show you some scripture. Okay, you got a few more moments. Colossians chapter 3 says, Whatever you do, do it heartily to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that the Lord, so knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance. He wants us to know when you walk in obedience, you will receive a reward of inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Ephesians 6, verse 8, knowing that whatsoever a good thing any man does, any man, any person does, the same shall be the same shall receive of the Lord. Everything you do, if it's the smallest thing at work and you're walking out of love to serve your boss and serve your your king and you do a small thing at at, at work, that gets seen by the Lord and the Lord rewards you. Do you believe this? We're living for eternity. Not for the I man, a a pleasing man, not the I service, not because I want someone to see my good work and I want them to praise me, I want them to encourage me, I want them to give me a reward here on the earth. No. The Lord, the Father is watching everything we do. This is is 2 John chapter 1 verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have worked for, but that we receive a full reward. It's in the Word. Revelation chapter 11 verse 18. And the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead, that they shall be judged, and that you shouldest give reward unto your servants, the prophets. What, what's God going to do? Give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy them which destroy the earth. God's going to reward everyone, small and great. Revelations 22, verse 12, these are the words of Jesus. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. Can you see what the Lord is saying? God wants to reward every single one of us. He says, behold, I come quickly and I'm I'm coming to give reward to every single person. 
John 14, Jesus' words again. Do you believe the Bible? Are you here to believe the Bible? The Word of God? John 14, what did Jesus say about the mansions in heaven? Look at this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, my Father's dwelling. That word house means dwelling where he, or residence. Basically saying where my Father resides, in my Father's house, where He resides, are many dwelling places. Use a different word. And it says, if it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you, a space for you, a position for you. I don't know about you, but if, can you imagine the, the Lord Jesus overseeing a work and he's, and he's building mansions for people. I heard stories where people, people have gone to heaven and come back. And some have said that every single thing, every soul you touched, every soul you saved, every single thing. One, one door had diamonds on it. And he said to the Lord, why is all these diamonds? Because every, every diamond represents a soul that you saved. Just decorated with diamonds. You remember that you're in heaven, there's streets of transparent gold. Everything's gold. Gold, the city of God, the pure city of God, the city, the new city of Jerusalem is going to come from heaven to the earth. Pure gold. You know how big it is? 2,400 miles, uh, kilometers. Drive to Melbourne, drive another trip past Melbourne, like come like another trip that's 800 kilometers, that's 1,600, then drive again. That's a long, long, that's a big city. But it's a square. You know what a square is? It's a cube, actually, we go a bit further. This is the city of God. It, it's as high as it is wide in the Bible. And if you go as high, 30,000 feet is like probably three or four kilometres. You're out of the atmosphere of the earth, the city of God. And I believe you inhabit the whole city right up top. This is God's dwelling place. God's throne will be there. We will live with Him. And He is building. I just I want us to have faith that He's He is developing, building. Remember this little little space we live for. It's going to be gone one day. Every person. I, I look at old pictures, old city pictures like 1905, and I look at those pictures. I think every single person on that on that picture is dead and gone. Everyone, not one alive. There's eight billion people on the planet. Give it 110 years. Every single person, no, no longer here. This is reality. Every single person, no longer here in 110 years. 110 years will happen, you know that. Don't live in the here and now forgetting that you will pass over into eternity. I've lived 54 years and I felt like, where did that go? Anyone that's over 50, where did it go? Even if you're over 40, you go, what, that was pretty quick. Another 40, you're 80. The Bible says 1,000 years with us is like one day to the Lord. And one day is like 1,000 years. It says it in two places, Psalms 90 verse 4 and uh, uh, Second Peter. Think about this for a second. A whole 1,000 years is like one day. So last 1,000 years, or, the, or even the first thousand years of, this, of the, of the 2,000 years that's gone since Jesus was here. That was like yesterday to the Lord. The next thousand years is like today. Today. Your whole life is like God's, first, God's day. It's still today for Him. That's your whole life, but it's just today. In the light of heaven, in the light of eternity, in the light of the Father, how He sees time, because He's outside of time, just like today. I'm trying to give us a time frame trying to get our heads around the fact that to God it's not God's not slack concerning His promise He's one day like a thousand years He will return you will face the Lord I will face God one day and give account of everything but let's have a heart to say Lord I want to obey Lord I want to I want to obey you and if I don't see the reward here on earth I know you will reward me in heaven